Dear fellow white people, today we're going to be talking about national intelligence and why it's more important than patience or time preference or, or these kind of uh, delay gratification, whatever um, sort of things that economists and psychologists and so on like to talk about. Um, it's specifically based on this paper that we published in uh, the Mankind Quarterly, of course, the best place to publish dissident science. And uh, that was published last December, uh, so what is that, two months ago or so. And uh, I didn't talk about it before because unfortunately there was uh, some failure of Emil's dexterity involving too much wine and slippery surfaces, and so I wasn't looking too good. But nevertheless, here we are back. And we're going to be talking about this. Uh, if you want to read the abstract, you can pause the video and do that, but I'm not going to read it. So, what do we want to explain? We want to explain this map, basically. So, here we have the Human Development Index, a kind of a composite made out of three, four, depending on how you conceptualize, indicators of how nice a country is, essentially. And um, so it's published by the UN, and it's the most commonly used of this. Here we have the 2017 uh, values, and you get this very familiar map where things are nice in Western countries, uh, also down these, and it's kind of moderately nice in many of these other ones, and it's not so nice in Africa, and it's kind of like, yeah, you know the drill. Um, this one is based uh, in part on GDP, or GNI, or one of these uh, measures, and that's why you get like super high values in some of these like oil, country uh, that shouldn't actually be that high. Um, so what the economists have been doing uh, for many decades, essentially they're talking about uh, vague human capital and specifically they're very interested in economic preferences because they think that people who take more time, who are basically more patient, uh, they invest more and then uh, these investments grow over time and, and so in a sense they have a, a weaker time preference. And time preference, the way you should think of this is a kind of strange term, is that you can have a preference for time, which is to say sooner rather than later. And they typically measure this by saying, would you rather have $50 today or $100 in a year? And so it really depends essentially on your implicit interest rate or discounting rate. And, uh, you know, if you give people a bunch of these kind of questions, you can figure out uh, the implied uh, discounting rate by some person or in this case, some country. Um, here we have a large study that was done recently. I think the data were collected in 2016, of this global preference survey. And uh, it's done by these Falk et al, very mainstream uh, kind of economists. And they had this big paper and this, I think, quarterly journal of economics, I think is one of the, the big ones. Uh, economists are very much into the five big journals and uh, it's a bunch of pseudo. Um, Anyway, this one is quite large, uh, large uh, because there's so many countries covered. Uh, this map, of course, we see there is uh, 76 countries. And most importantly is that uh, each country is covered by approximately a thousand persons, which is in a representative sample. So it's not just like some random university students uh, that differ between countries. It's um, a representative sample because the data is collected by Gallup. And uh, in each of these surveys, they gave them a few questions which can be used to infer um, these time preferences uh, and some other non-cognitive traits that uh, Falk et al. was interested in. And so that's basically what this map is based on. Um, uh, their plot, well, they don't, actually, they don't actually have a plot like this, but they have some regressions that essentially talk uh, about this sort of thing. And so here we see the, the 76 countries and we have the, the patience measure or time preference or whatever you want to call this. Patience, I think, is the more normal human friendly term um, and not related to this weirdo economic f economist theory uh, on the y-axis i put the country well-being and i've conceptualized this as the s factor it's very similar to the uh, human development index but it's not as biased by this uh, gdp per capita uh, measure in fact there's no gdp per capita in this collection it's it's a summary score based on 50 something indicators that don't include economic ones, but nevertheless correlate 0.8 or whatever with them. Because everything good correlates with everything other good essentially at the country level. Not, not everything, but close. Anyway, to get to the plot, we see up here, um, these are the North West Europe and offshoots. So essentially people who are populated by not exactly Germanic people, but kind of North Europeans in some sense. Um, we have a bunch of other categories and you see the normal pattern, right? Uh, we can see that there's Essentially, it's a bit non-linear, except for these kind of people here. Um, anyway, so there is a sizable correlation between 
how nice a country is overall uh, and uh, how patient it is according to this Gallup survey sort of thing. And it's a point five six, right? It's pretty good. Um, of course, we have our own plot. Um, unfortunately, here I include the one with the, all the countries, but um, essentially we'll look more or less uh, the same with only the 50, uh, 76 countries. Um, our plot looks like this, and we have the same kind of coloring, and here we have the national IQs instead, and I use the Richard Lynn ones uh, because they are based on 50% uh, more sources than the Baker's recalculation ones, and so of course uh, they have more countries covered that are covered with actual real numbers instead of kind of estimated from the uh, from neighboring countries and uh, more samples and so on. So um, I'm using them for now because they just seem to be better. Um, anyway, what we get here is that the, the correlation is actually stronger 7-7 seven, seven, um, than the 56 here and that conclusion is not different if you only look at these uh, 56 countries or the 76 countries. Uh, finally, we can also look at the national IQs and the time preference or patience itself and it looks like this. We kind of see that there is a decent correlation. 6-1 is actually stronger than this one. And uh, we can see there's a bunch of outliers up here in that these essentially Germanic countries, um, they have, or Germanic founded countries in the case of US, um, they have just much more patience than would, expected, uh, would be expected by their IQ, at least insofar as measured by this, uh, this model. Um, if we actually look at the correlations, uh, this table got cut in two in the Mankind Quarterly Journal for whatever reason. Anyway, I put it here again. Um, so what we essentially see is we have the different IQ measures. Here's the LV is Lin and Van Hanen, and uh, B is Becker, R is Rindemann. Rindemann more is more based on the uh, scholastic ability, so it's essentially more weighted toward the PISA results. Becker's is... Um, it also uses these, but uh, I think it gives them 50-50. Lindemann here gives PISAS type stuff, TIMS, uh, these sort of things. It gives them, I think, 3 to 1 weight compared to the national IQs. The World Bank did their own um, homogenized uh, natural scores or something like that. Um, these are actually, you can see they actually have a bit stronger correlations with stuff. And so it would seem that the World Bank has some like special way to derive scores. Uh, that is actually not true. I checked the report and the reason that the World Bank scores correlate higher is actually because they use not only uh, observed scores, but they used model predicted scores at adulthood. And so they adjust for infant mortality and education, some other stuff. which is to say that their score is not just made of abilities. It's actually a composite based on stuff that you're trying to predict that's actually part of the S factor. And so that's why the correlation is approaching unity, right? You, uh, approaching one. So essentially, you should never use this World Bank thing for anything, except to kind of say that uh, mainstreamers can also use national IQs, except they're doing it incorrectly. Um, what we see, uh, though, is that um, the national IQ ones predict um, the, um, the S-factor quite well. Uh, down here, we have the values with weights. Uh, the below the below diagonal is with weights. So the 7-7 seven, seven here is the... The 7, 7 we have here. Uh, we also see if we look at the um, S factor here, we have the the folk, that's the time preference, TP time preference, 56, that's the same, hopefully, as here, yes. And uh, there's uh, some other people, Wang, they did a similar kind of study to folk, except worse, uh, they measured fewer people, university samples that varied between countries. Some countries only had a few people. Um, like I think it was New Zealand has like very low time preference because they, I don't know, it's outlier low. Rieger is a meta analysis of these time preference studies that use data from I think six or ten um, different ones. Uh, I don't know which Rieger I used here. I think it's probably the ten version. Anyway, so like ten or so of these kind of Wang folk like studies and uh, combined them. The thing is that with the Rieger meta analysis that it combines a lot of kind of shoddy studies, and that studies are not very good. And so in this paper, we used the, the Wang one, uh, the Falk one, I mean. The Wang one uh, we used initially, but I changed the Falk one when I found it. The other ones here, uh, risk-taking, positive repro reciprocity, and negative reciprocity, also. These are some other non-cognitive traits, also measured by Falk in the same study. Um, as you can see, however, they don't actually correlate significantly with S-factor and um, some of them correlate uh, with IQ, but uh, it's not in totally obvious ways. Why is risk taking negatively with IQ? I mean, you could say that individual level, maybe. I don't know. Um, they don't really predict the thing they're supposed to predict. And um, 
we'll see later that they this continues to be the case. Um, anyway, the causal model that we have in mind uh, goes roughly like this. Roughly, there are some uh, some things that are not included. Anyway, we have essentially the the root cause is demographics because demographics is destiny. Then we have the human capital causes. So these relate to the this the the traits of humans that are related to why a country is nice instead of other stuff such as uh, history, geography, or natural resources, something like this. History probably should be also up here, but the essentially human capital here is the current humans, and human. the history could be something uh, prior humans who are no longer there, uh, uh, say uh, whether you got colonized like 20 years ago or whatever. So anyway, um, so these are the things that most people talk about, and these are the things we like. Uh, however, here we have this nice new survey uh, with a bunch of measures of these things, and we have all the Richard uh, Linden ones, and the Heiner Rindemann, the Debbie Becker recalculations, and all on. So we can put these in one model, and we can see which of these are better at predicting these uh, these varied social outcomes. And so the S here is the the S factor, and so what we find is that if you take indicators of how nice a country is doing, like you can take I don't know life expectancy, you can take uh, murder rates, you can do all these kind of things. They tend to all correlate in expected ways, such as countries you know that are better in one are better in another, and when you have that, then you get a, a general factor, and the general factor here is the S factor, and you can also use each indicator. And so, causally speaking, though, a lot of these things, such as life expectancy or infant mortality, they relate, they cause other things in this kind of big cluster fuck of causality that we're not gonna pretend to um, uh, to figure out here. We're just gonna treat them as a kind of big black box that things that like mutually cause each other in complicated ways but that are that are also as a group mostly caused by these outside factors that are not caused by these uh, some of them there will be some some backwards causation like an hour that goes from one of let's say this one up here and then this one up here or whatever uh, those are the things that a lot of normal academics are interested in but we are less interested in them because research indicates that a backwards causation or reverse causation from these kind of outcomes to intelligence seems to be not very high uh, or not large, so in this study we're going to assume they're zero, even though it's incorrect, but it's more correct than doing the opposite. Um, anyway, so what we have here is we have many outcomes because we have the 51 indicators of the Social Progress Index. It's a website, kind of like the UN one, whether that has the Human Capital or not the Human Development Index, but instead of being based on free, free, um, free indicators, it's based on 51, and they have some theory about how they should be grouped and so on. Uh, of course, if you do a fact analysis of these variables, they don't support their theory at all. I don't know where they got this theory from. They, I think they just made it up. And uh, because this uh, social progress index is made by some essentialist, uh, it's not essentially some socialist, uh, so, um, socialist sociologist, almost in the same word, um, they hate economic outcomes. And so they don't use GDP per capita or any other economic measure. Uh, because it's uh, beyond GDP, that's its own marketing. Uh, in our case, however, we are also interested in these, so we I made or found another six of these typical economist ones, and it's like uh, GDI or GDP per capita and some the growth rates since I think the 1990s to now, um, stuff like this. And we have the, the S factor that you saw in the plot before, uh, you know, one metric to rule them all and all that. Um, we can fit a bunch of models for comparison purposes and robustness tests. So essentially we get uh, almost 500 regression models that have been fit. Um, so to sum things up though, we can begin with the main results and the main results we just have the, the S factor, so the, the most summary of how nice a country is. And we're mostly looking at these two lines here. So we have, we have eight models, each number here signifies a, a regression model. Um, the point of the first model here is that, um, yeah, so what we have is we have the IQ here, and the, the first model, and the reason I want to zoom down is because it has, you can see the full sample size, 173 here, and uh, when you then go down to the 76 countries, you get this correlation, so that's a bit smaller. Um, this value is different from the, the one that plot before, because I think uh, this one uses different weights than the, uh, than the regression. Uh, um, then the correlation, I think that's why, or is it because I'm subsetting? Whatever the case, these numbers are highly similar, and um, if we zoom into the 76 countries, we lose some range, uh, we, we have some range restriction, because um, uh, some of the countries, the, the 100 countries or so that are not included here, they overwhelmingly 
or they include a lot of uh, the African countries where it's very difficult to get actual sampling uh, or survey data. Anyway, what we see if we compare the national IQs alone, 61 here and 48, so uh, national IQs is a bit stronger, but not um, not extremely so. Um, however, once we, in model four, we include them together on this subset of countries, you see that the, the national IQs one has a, a lot of stars, and that means it's, uh, it's way beyond what you'd expect by chance and the time preference though positive is not exactly above it's, it doesn't reach uh, the 1% uh, p-value here it actually does reach p05 but since we are more rigorous I use the 1% the cutoff here and it doesn't reach them in any of the other ones in model 5 what we do is that we add uh, these dummy variables for which uh, which region of the world um, a country is in and these are the same ones as we had here these ones right um, so what we then do here in the model six is that we get rid of the dummy variables, but we add the other uh, five uh, non-cognitive measures that these uh, Falk et al. economists came up with. And you can see this doesn't really change much. National IQ keeps beating it, and time preference or patience keeps being um, keeps being below what we can detect as beyond chance. Right, um, the p-value is is high. Right, um, the stars come when the p-value is quite small. Anyway, uh, if we add a lot of controls, like both the non-cognitive ones and these um, uh, these regional dummies, national IQ still, still is 51. Uh, this one is now negative. Uh, it's getting embarrassing here, right? Um, if we, instead of using the regional dummies, we use this spatial lag where we, uh, where we take the average S factor of the neighboring countries and we include this as a prediction of the S factor um, in a given country, right, in a regression. So you you try to guess from the neighbor's value and also from the IQs and then also these non-cognitive ones, then still uh, we just can't make this patient's uh, variable do much work and the IQ one just keeps being strong. Um, so it's kind of embarrassing uh, for these economists. And uh, a different way of doing this is that we, we can look at uh, different combinations of outcome uh, variables. Or for instance, we can change the, instead of predicting the S factor, we can predict the human development index, which correlates uh, probably 0.9 with the S factor or something like this, 0.96 here. Um, and so that, that won't, probably won't make much difference. Um, if we just look at these two columns, uh, these are the ones we're most interested in. Um, we can see that in each and every case, the IQ one is larger and the IQ one is usually um, a lot larger. The main exception is this one, but it's based on the smallest data set we have. That's the Wang one that's the least representative and has like mostly university samples and this sort of thing. Uh, so of course, if you reduce most of the variation in, in, in national intelligence, national intelligence can't predict much. And uh, of course, being small in sample size, there's also even more sampling error. Um, we can use the Riga one, which makes the sample size go larger, but more uh, this, uh, the time preference measure is worse here. It gets closer, but um, still, and this is all with the spatial lag as the control. Um, again, we can, do, we can do different stuff. In this one, we have to be back to the Falk measure, but we change to the HDI and still IQ beats it. Uh, here we, instead of using the uh, Richard Lin's IQs, we use Rindemann's IQs uh, and the Falk ones, and we use the SPI and the same, 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 right? We keep trying different variations and we just keep finding more or less the same um, on average, right? Visually, we can also look at like this. And here we have the, uh, the kind of five models that we've been comparing or we can compare um, for these different ones. And um, what we have here is that um, these are the different model sets. And so we see that national IQs alone looks like this, depending on which national IQ and which, um, like whether it's uh, with weights or not weights. Uh, this one I think here is the one Richard Lynch without weights. And uh, the reason that the weighted ones are, are weaker is that if we go back to the plot uh, with national IQs is that essentially we have massive China here with high IQ, but Currently not so nice social outcomes. Uh, China should kind of go up here, which it will do in the next 30 years or whatever. And so this correlation will be a bit higher. Uh, but currently China is suffering from its communist past and uh, corruption and that sort of thing. Anyway, so, but over here we see that overall we kind of take a, an average across this model of national Q. They will explain something like 55% of the variance in this, uh, this country well-being if we take the the time preference then they will explain something like 35 um, so there's 20 percent more variance here if we combine the model we get these and the height of this the same color here is is usually only a slightly higher and what this just tells you again is that adding 
Adding time preference to a model that already has an actual IQ does not improve the model's ability to predict re, uh, the world inequality very much. Um, putting a bunch of dummy variables in the, uh, in the, the model, that improves the model a lot. And what this is telling us is that, uh, if we go back to this one, is that a lot of these values is that um, there is something good or bad about these countries in these regions um, beyond national IQ differences and time preferences and all these other non-variables uh, or non-cognitive variables insofar as we can measure them. And um, we don't really know what these are, but we can just see that they're there. And some of them have some starts and that's because there's enough countries in that region. Um, interesting here is we can note that every single one of these values is negative. Um, the comparison group here is the, um, is the Western group. So it's the red group here, that is the, uh, the, base, the base group. Um, so that's the one, that's why it doesn't appear here because that's the one we've essentially set to zero. And so when these values are negative compared to the one we set to zero, it means they're worse off. So essentially what this, these models are telling us is that these other non-Western countries are doing worse. Uh, well, I mean, so there's some Eastern Europe here and I think Southern Europe, but these other, these non-North Western European countries are doing worse than you would expect even when you control for six different non cognitive measures and national IQs. And still they're doing worse for some reason. We don't know what it is. We just can say that they're definitely doing worse. Um, anyway, that's what, what this was telling us. The difference between four and five is that here we use regional dummies where we say, is this country in Europe or not? And here we say we're going to we try to predict from the neighboring countries instead. Uh, and so this one should kind of be better, but this one turns out to be better in practice. I don't know why. Um, Anyway, it does not make much difference for the conclusions. Um, so, okay, but what about the other outcomes? What if instead of looking at just the S factor, you know, the, the one composite factor of how nice a country is doing, what if we look at instead the 51 indicators of this social progress index? And we can do that, of course, and we don't want to sit and look at all these 400 models, so 500 or whatever. Um, so here we have a plot that shows the standardized betas of the IQs, and these are the Richard ones, uh, Richard Lynn ones, and here we have the the time preference patient stuff. And we can see that the red dot is essentially not, uh, it's mostly much larger or larger than the, the green dot. And the green dot will be the, the ability of time preference to predict stuff. And here is zero. So often when stuff goes here, it means it's close to zero. Um, there are a few things where the green one or turqu turquoise one is larger, like here, you have the globally ranked universities. And the, these are, um, these like top universities are especially placed in these like Northwestern countries, which we saw in the plot earlier, have very high patient scores as an outlier. And so when you, when you put this into a regression model, you get the result that patients predicts it better than IQ does. Uh, and that's essentially because East Asians that also have uh, high IQs don't have a lot of top universities. And um, that's pretty much what this one model is telling us. There are some other ones, for instance, this one, or that's one where, um, where, uh, where the, predict the, the values are reversed. But if we take across all these models, we get something like the median national IQ is something like 3.6, 3.5, 3, 3, depending on how you calculate these medians, um, something like three to four times more important than time preference to predict across these 51 outcomes. So it's really quite broad, the supremacy of national IQs to this time preference stuff. And it also holds if you don't include controls, as I recall, these include the controls that we saw uh, in these um, in these models. And if you don't include them, whoops, here, then you still get something very similar. Uh, and if we look at the economist outcomes, um, again, we have these six economist ones, and uh, we have GDP growth. And as I recall, it's uh, based on the, con the GDP growth since 1990s to now. So I think about 30 years, a bit less than 30 years. And we can also just look at the current GDP levels, um, GNI is a different way to conceptualize it, but they correlate very highly. Um, I just included it here for, uh, for some diversity. And a, a more interesting one, I think, is median income, uh, because median income is not affected by uh, whether some con or whether your country is one of those that give very low tax, um, tax levels to companies. And so if we think of, for instance, Ireland, which is now one of the wealthiest GDP capital uh, GDP per capita countries in the world, but Ireland isn't really a wealthy country. It's just that like Coca-Cola or whatever, some other like large companies, they move their 
official headquarters to Ireland so they can pay 0% or whatever the company tax is over there. And that boosts the GDP per capita of Ireland extremely so, but does not really change the median income. And so median income is, is a better way of doing this. But uh, as you see here, median income gives even, even results that are even worse for time preference than the other ones. And the values here keep being, you know, it's like two, two and a half times better, 1.8 in one particular combination here, but 7.7 .7 if you take the mean instead of the median, blah, blah, blah. No matter kind of how you, you slice this stuff, just national IQs keep beating this uh, the preference stuff. Um, so if we are to summarize this study, uh, we can draw these conclusions. We do these head-to-head -head comparisons. Essentially, not, not every time, but almost every time we try stuff, national IQs is just much better at time uh, to predict uh, how nice a country is compared to uh, to time preferences or to patients or these uh, whatever you call it um, and the the current uh, non-cognitive trait uh, measures are quite poor uh, I didn't go into detail here but if you read this appendix here what you find is that um, they didn't actually measure uh, directly patients in each of these uh, uh, each of these thousand sample size um, in each country, they what they did is that they had a one large sample where they measured these economist outcomes, like these uh, delayed gratification stuff, and then they found some questions that Gallup wanted to ask that predicted this economist measure as as good as they could find. And then in the other Gallup surveys, they don't have the economist measure stuff, uh, the economist stuff measured at all. They only use this one, two, three, whatever items in the Gallup surveys that predict them, okay? So these, that gives you for each person in the Gallup surveys a very crude prediction that you assume is it's based on the same model that you fit on some uh, some other sample set. Um, so you're assuming predictive invariance here uh, that's very likely to be false. And then you, you take the average of these predicted uh, patient scores in each country, and those are the ones they have on their map. And so when you kind of expl explicate the methodology like this, it's a lot more wonky and uh, that's probably why they didn't really explain it in detail in their, in their big paper. Um, if you actually do studies where you measure the trait you want, um, uh, patients or not necessarily patient, but any kind of non-cognitive trait across countries and you do the typical um, measurement invariance testing, usually multi-group confirmative facts analysis, uh, but you can also do differential item, differential item testing, DIF. And when you do this, you usually get like massive failures of measurement invariance. And that essentially tells us that these non-cognitive measures, they're not really working the same way in different countries uh, for whatever reason. And so the scores uh, are questionable to use to compare each other. In this study, of course, we've used them anyway because these are the only ones that exist and because other people are using them, not because I think personally that they're uh, super, super good. I'm just saying these are currently the best there is and I'm a very pragmatic person, so I think we should use the best there is until something better comes along, and then we'll use that afterwards. Um, the results, we, we went over here, we tried almost 60 different outcomes, um, and results are quite consistent, right? Um, three, three times, sometimes even almost four times better uh, predictive, uh, or the ability of national IQs to predict outcomes is three to four times better, sometimes maybe only two times better, um, across all these kind of ways to compare it. Um, and it's also true when you include different covariates, whether you control for regions with the dummies or you use a spatial lag, or you include the other non-cognitive measures or you don't, and so on. Um, results are just very consistent. Um, and this, uh, I think the final point here is that this result is despite the well-known issues with national IQ estimates. And here, of course, I'm thinking about um, some countries don't have real measures as such. They're imputed uh, based on the neighboring countries. We know this method is quite accurate, but quite accurate is not wholly accurate. It would be better to sample uh, a specific country instead of using the neighbors. Uh, some of the samples are old or use a test that is old or is only done on like children or, you know, draw a man, sticker, blah, blah, blah. There's, these samples are not, they're not in any way perfect, but they're the best that we have currently. So that's what we use. And so the fact that despite the issues with the national IQ estimates, they still beat these non-cognitive ones, even when there are six of them, uh, that really is, I think, a testament to the, the strength of the intelligence to predict stuff and the, the strength of this paradigm, or uh, what should we say, the school of, of thinking about intelligence as being the largest uh, root cause of social inequality, like diversity and in intelligence, right? Uh, because, of course, measurement errors 
in national IQs, they would tend to make predictions worse, not better. Um, so to really sum things up, this is what the study conclude. We take on our glasses and we see the world as it really is. Thank you and see you around.